So, so Derek, we learned earlier today that your job has a, an expiration date on it. Yes. You're not eligible. Apparently, from the moment you took the job, there's an expiration date to it. So how have you survived as long as you've survived so far? That's a classic question, right? <laughs> Shortest tenure in the uh, C-suite, but I think, you know, really looking at where marketing is going and relentlessly focusing on what the consumer needs are and doing my best. You know, it's, it's trite to say being flexible or being agile, but that's the key. And I, I, I think if you don't evolve to change in that, that tenure that you speak of, Definitely finite and keep getting short. And for those of you who don't know, ten years, not ten years. I, mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I learned that years ago with my father. Um, let's take a half a step back and then let's jump into everything you just said because I realize, like myself, probably many of you in the room don't actually know the company you work for, what it does, where are they, what they represent. So give, give the room at least 30 seconds to a minute. Who, who is Yesway? Certainly. Um, Yesway is one of the fastest growing retail chains. We operate, we own, as well as operate convenience stores. We're in a nine state region. None of the states are near here. Uh, we are backed by a private equity firm, Brookwood Financial, that is based here on the North Shore of Boston. So uh, myself and my marketing team, actually Darren, our, our head of brand, and Mike who runs loyalty for us. We're based here, but we travel quite a bit. Stores are in Texas, New Mexico, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, Wyoming, and Oklahoma. So, obviously, like you said, not, not here in this perspective. We know the convenience store world is a hyper-competitive one. Yep. Right? What makes you guys different? Yeah, it's kind of fascinating. Um, Brian's talk, how he talked about Metro and how Im important that is as a marketer really going to your first question, and I know we were joking to kick things off, but it's about metric. And so for us, we consciously chose where we wanted to open and own and operate stores. We looked at areas that were business friendly, where we could move quickly. Um, and you know, we built a chain from concept to today we have 442 stores in less than you know five or six year time frame. So it was important because, yes, it is competitive, but when you look at convenience, it's highly fragmented. You know, there is no Amazon or no Walmart of, of the convenience channel. And wherever you live regionally, those tend to be the best players. I always jokingly say the biggest within our world is not the best. And that's not to disparage, you know, 7-Eleven, who is the biggest, or Circle K, who's the second biggest. But if you ask a consumer who lives somewhere where my prior company, Rudders, is, they'll tell you that's the best. Where we have also branded stores and where we operate those in New Mexico and Texas, they'll say that's the best. Here, they'll say Cumberland Farms or Noria or one of the other regional players, maybe All Town Fresh, that that's the best. So very fragmented, very regional. The best tend to be family-owned, operated. Um, companies that have evolved, you know, going back to that point around change. And if you think about the role that convenience stores play, like you said, one, there isn't a national player, right? So that, I think it's a great articulation for all of us to think through. When you, when you consider the idea of convenience stores versus dollar stores versus like grocery stores, yeah. forget the mega stores, like we're not talking about we're not talking Walmart or Kroger or things like that, but the, the smaller, more local ones, yeah. right? Where, where do your stores play in that perspective? Yeah, I mean, we're all selling convenience as a actual luxury or necessity that consumers are seeking. So we view all of that as competitive. You know, I even view the big guy. Kroger had, at one time, they had about 2,000 convenience stores. They sold it to a company very similar to mine that's based here via EG Group. Um, dollar stores have stated that they want to sell more fresh perishable products because that's what consumers want. So we have to look at them as that's a convenience store. You know, for years people have talked about CVS or Walgreens as that's a convenience store that skews more female and some of the items that they sell. So we really draw inspiration and we compete with all of them. And I think as a marketer, it's daunting, certainly, 
but I think that also gives some assurance in terms of being able to borrow and research and duplicate, as I love to say, is a form of R and D that we can take from another channel and put it into our channel. Um, yes, way consciously went after rural markets or even urban markets that are food gaps. Uh, some of these may also be healthcare gadgets, or they may be access to fresh product gadgets. And there's, there's some purpose there in terms of filling that desert and filling that void and bringing higher quality, fresher, better quality products, but also bringing service that matters and builds some form of long-term loyalty. So you're, you're tying, for this room especially, you're tying kind of two parts together that I want to get to. So I always think it's important that we bring the so what to the conversation, yes. right? So earlier when we started, you mentioned insights, and I think you've just done a good job describing what are you learning from the consumer and what they need, and then what are you solving for that? So that makes a lot of sense. Now talk to me for everyone in this room, like how do you market that? Right? What, is, what is that like to tell that story? And let's keep that open-ended for a second, and we'll probably dive into it a little bit more. Yeah, um, I think the classic marketing challenge, right? You have to not only focus on the four Ps, but with my marketing team, we talk about now there's really six. So you have to have people and process being the additional piece. And, and so, Joe, to the heart of your question, you know, part of that challenge is how do you build a brand, and keep your eye five years down the road, and tell the story while also being very transactional and promotional? Um, you know, people who are seeking convenience, they have an immediate need state. The food we sell is about immediate consumption within the next 30 minutes, maybe one hour. Yes, is there some take home that's there? Absolutely. I would say beverages, you know, I always say we're the channel of thirst. If you're thirsty, we're the first place you think of. Because if you go to a QSR or a fast feeder, they may only have Pepsi products, they may only have Coke products. Well, guess what, we have everything. From beer to sparkling water to Red Bull Monster, you name it. So I think, you know, part of the challenge is unifying marketing with merchandising, understanding the role that a category plays in those different need states that a consumer may have on their trips and their missions, when they're seeking thirst versus energy, versus fuel, versus food. And then trying to build the brand to be relevant in each of those moments while burnishing your overall aspirational Here's the brand and the yes way story. I'm gonna, I'm gonna push you one level deeper, right? That's a good, like, I think from a CMO perspective, right? That's exa yep. exactly the answer I think many of us would expect. So I have one step deeper, maybe it's because the people in the room, right, who support you. Yep. But like, what does that start to look like? Is that more social? Is that more digital out of home? Like, because like you said, convenience is I'm out. I didn't, I might not have left my house to get this specific product, but I'm out and I realize I want something. Yes. Right? So, so talk to me about what is that channel, not maybe channel of choice, it's probably too specific, but like what are the channels you're using and how, how does that look and feel to the consumer? Yeah, I always talk about starting with the store and working out. So, you know, the people part was a conscious, you know, piece or the fifth P, let's say. And those people could be our team. And so to, to your question, if I have a dollar to spend, where am I best served? So starting with that store and those touch points that a consumer sees when they're out of something. Simple, you're at the gas pumps, there's a reason why there's a sign on top of the pump, or a screen within the pump with video messaging or auditory messaging and music that tries to set a tone. There's a reason why there's you know, point of sale or point of purchase, a dangler, a wobbler, right on a, a particular product. And then social. I think social and mobile, or I'll sometimes say so low mo because you want to have social, you want to have loyalty, and in mobile, and the best places to build those tends to be on some kind of mobile interface with geofencing and all the technology that everyone hears about. But when someone is within my site, sending a message to them at that point is a lot more valuable than when someone is at home and may not have that need state or when they're at work. With that said, I still want the consideration set. So there is some brand work that has to be done that you know we'll do OTT and we'll do video and things that allow us to tell the story better. Um, I, I think that's the big challenge with retail. And with convenience retail, we call it hyperspeed because it's even quicker. We have to be adept at literally all of those channels. And we will also partner with 
supply it. So while you know I can sit here and say every convenience store I've worked for we've run Super Bowl at, seems crazy, right? I mean it goes against everything about I gotta have it now or I'm out or immediate consumption. But if Pepsi is running an ad and they're one of my strategic partners and I'm able to get a 30 second local buy in the regions that we operate, pass through or in tandem with them, now it becomes a lot more powerful. Now customers see it. I can tell the heritage story. You know, we are one of the brands that we operate, our main go-to-market brand is called Awesome's. And unless you lived in New Mexico or West Texas, you probably wouldn't know anything about that brand. But for people who do live there, it's a lifestyle. Um, very rustic, they grew up with it. They get milk, they got their you know, loaves of bread, fresh product, and our signature food service offering is burritos. And so we have a world famous platform with that. Um, me and the marketing team, we're about to celebrate the 50th anniversary for that. How do we make that something that customers celebrate and care about while also telling the yes way story and how we're now stewards and caretakers of this beloved legacy heritage brand, but also get something that's quantifiable where I know if I'm spending a million dollars for this campaign, it's going to give me a 10x in terms of margin that it drives through the registers in the 440 plus stores. So, so many things to build on, but let's, let's use, um, somebody used AI, right? So one of the buzzwords, we won't use that one, I promise. <laughs> uh, but let's use another fun buzzword with like retail media. Yes. So you mentioned the idea of like Pepsi running a Super Bowl ad, clearly you yourself are not going to run a national uh, Super Bowl ad. Not yet, maybe. One maybe day. one day, right? We've <laughs> got a few more states to cover to make it national. But, but in all sincerity, like, how do you tie into what your global partner or national partners like a Pepsi or a Coke yep. or a Monster are doing? I'll use retail media as the overarching statement because it can come in all kinds of forms as we're reading or all learning together. But like, how do you think about it in that, in that perspective? Yeah, I think that is one of the great things about retail marketing is that my team will hear me say this. When you're dealing with a supplier and it's a supplier partner, that there's a difference between a winning partner vendor. So we have a lot of vendors It's very transactional. I'm trying to get the lowest cost of goods, I want rebates, and we'll go to market and I'll sell as much of their product in the stores. And it's a good partnership. When you have a winning partner, you go extra layers. So instead of just dealing with the trade team or the sales team, I'm now dealing with the brand team. So their brand team will engage with ours and we will open up all kinds of opportunities. You know, Pepsi is a great example. We also do this with Red Bull, we'll do it with Monster. So it's not even saying we'll have one category captain, it's how can I gain access to F1 because they'll want the same things that we want. If I have 40 stores around Austin, Texas, which we sort of do, and if Red Bull is doing a race there in October, which Red Bull are. doesn't just want to win the race, which they probably will, but they also want to make sure they're selling more cases. And if we can embed our teams and we can do a combination, social campaign, loyalty campaign, TV campaign, radio with activation in the stores, supported by their sales and our team members, and there's displays and signage and incentives, and then they host some of our teams or the best stores that sell the most, these programs truly become transformation. And, and in that sense, I assume, because now you're tying trade, which we don't talk about in the media too much, along with obviously the media and marketing, which many of us in this room do, but the ultimate execution, right, or measurement of success is the idea that says, oh, on this week last year, we sold a million dollars worth of product. And this week, because of the extra effort we put in, it was 1.2, obviously, I mean, have those numbers, but that is that the overall, like, partner, when you think about a winning partnership, that's where you're trying to get trade, marketing and sales really in the same room, seeing the ultimate vision together, is that fair? Absolutely, Joe. I think that is one of the beauties of retail, is that our scorecard is literally every day. You know, when I wake up in the morning, I'm looking at the prior hour or the prior day sales, and knowing that the moves that I make today can be manifest in sales that I'll see as soon as tomorrow. Very few marketers have an opportunity to impact things that aggressively and that quickly. And I think to your point, it's, while that's a blessing, I think the curse side of that is that your scorecard is right in front of you. 
And so when you're looking at a brand campaign and you're asking a private equity firm that may not have the patience to say, give us a year, give us four more months, give us more time, and our net promoter score is going up, and that's what the objective here is, it also has to drop sales. It has to be real time. Um, you know, we have people in the stores that are compensated and that are bonus on how much they can grow gross profit. And I also say what gets measured gets done, right? And if you incentivize the behaviors that you want, you're more likely to get them. So going back to the Red Bull, you know, when we do those kinds of partnerships, it involves media, it will involve retail media, but it's very measurable. And then we know what to change or what to do differently going forward based on if it moved cases or if it did not. So I started the earlier session with a dad joke. Um, I won't do one now, but use a good cheesy line, which is like, what gets measured gets done, right? It's a classic one in business. I'll use another one, which is, in my perspective or my experience, the idea that success can happen by accident, but failures happen on purpose. So let me ask you, maybe as, a, as some insight to the room, one, two, any, any examples you can kind of think of, what are things that you try that you're like, God, I thought that was going to be a good idea, but just landed flat, like something about it went wrong, and therefore you learned not only not to do the same thing next time, but you learned how to iterate yeah, I mean, I, I think when you deal with retail and you deal with marketing, you are, I mean, everyone has the other pokey saying, the fail fast, and all of that crap, right? I think the key is to learn from the failures. And so, I mean, there's a number of things. The last company I was with, uh, we had an anniversary. And we were launching a line of signature trucks. And I've actually shared this with some of my team as a, don't do that again. So. Everyone loves your own brain, and it's tempting to say, oh, people are going to just love this. It's the 50th anniversary. I'm going to do what Hess did, and for those of you who know Hess, they make those collectible trucks. And you go in people's offices who have nothing to do with fuel, they have Hess trucks in there. Well, I was building a brand, and well, why, why can't I have a branded Hess-style truck? And I'm going to make, you know, at the time I did 100,000 of these, say. Um, printed them up. Use that 100,000. I had the foresight to put three years in the future and say limited edition, collectible, must buy. All, all the buzzwords. All the buzzwords. I mean, it was beautiful packaging, a little mini semi tanker truck. We may have sold 7,000. <laughs> so no, I'm not a math major, but 7,000 is way less than 100,000. Right? Way less than 100. I mean, literally could not give them away. And this is giving all employees. Christmas presents, and here's your anniversary <laughs> present. And was, was there cash inside the tanker? It's, I already have three of these tanker trucks I don't need anymore. Let's just say there's a warehouse outside of Pittsburgh that is still full of 90,000 plus of these trucks. So fast forward, the other side of that though is you can also be too cautious. So Darren here, um, he and I did a deal with the Texas Motor Speedway this year. So you talk about marketing, and we get a lot of pass through. We said, we want to do our own deal. We want to put a store in there. We want to have concessions. Oh, at the raceway itself? At the raceway. Like a pop-up shop. A pop-up store, everything. So we want to innovate this legacy brand and show how agile and nimble and everything. So Coca-Cola is their title beverage sponsor. They get fired up. And I have the, hey, let's do a collectible cup like Disney and McDonald's used to do. Awesome concept, but I was a little gun shot. So from your truck days? From my truck days. So I tell my category manager, scarcity is not a bad thing. I'd rather run out <laughs> than have a warehouse full. She, to her credit, she did 100,000. So same volume. They were gone in less than a week. So then I'm sitting there saying, dang it. Can we get another million of those? It's like, no, we got a 16 week lead time. The race is in September, so it's not going to happen. So, you know, next year I'll try to balance it, but it just shows that it's hard to forecast. You can have the best data, the best intentions, the perfect storm, as long as you can pivot and, you know, not vet the whole farm. Even with those trucks, I can still talk about it. You know, no one lost their job, thank God, but it was a cluster failure. Whereas with these collectible cups that had Coca-Cola, they, they sponsor, uh, eight different NASCAR drivers. We had their likenesses on the cups. So there were four of them, 25,000 of each, gone within seconds. And so now we have stores clamoring 
and hopefully we've created an opportunity that in the spring we'll do it again and you know, maybe we'll do half of those. That's awesome. That's a great, that's a great story. Um, as we wrap up, maybe give the audience obviously always a chance to ask questions. One golden nugget for the room, like you said, you've been in the CMO position in multiple places. Any advice for people from a career standpoint, what to watch out for, how to position themselves for an opportunity that you have? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, some of the trite things you'll hear, but they are real is you have to surround yourself with talent. You have to understand your strengths and your weaknesses and look to complement them. Um, my team hears me say it all the time, I'm a strength-based marketer. So I believe in focusing on strengths and trying to address those as a way to drive growth. I always say it's easier to get a current customer to buy more than to get a non-customer for the first time. Classic marketing truths. Not that many people subscribe to them. A lot of people will spend energy and effort focusing on weaknesses. You know, when we look at my stores, I always say I'd rather focus on the top 100 and get them to sell 10% more than the bottom 100 and try to get them to sell 50% more. That 10% on the strength will serve you much better. I think from a career standpoint, flexibility and agility is mission critical. I've literally lived all over the country. <laughs> So I'm not shy to go where the opportunities are. And I think that separates people. Some marketers won't do that. You know, I have friends who I worked at P&G and I was a brand manager. And they just did not want to leave a multinational firm. They just felt, hey, this is where I want to be and I'll take that path. Nothing wrong with that. Slow, steady works for some. Um, I have others who were, well, I don't know if I can get into retail. You know, I'm, I'm a brand guy. And I think always challenge yourself, stretch yourself, and go after the opportunities. Um, you know, one thing that has stuck with me is uncertainty breeds leadership, and it creates the best opportunities that you'll ever have. And I always say, when I get comfortable, to me that's a dangerous word. Anytime I'm like, wow, this is really good, even my wife knows that. She's always like, you said complacent, you said comfortable. <laughs> okay, I'm not comfortable in that aspect. But, you know, lean in and go towards discomfort. That is where change happens. That's where opportunities, that's where innovation lives. Um, it's about understanding uncertainty and knowing how to thrive in it. The Yes Way obviously isn't taking over Boston anytime soon. At least I don't think they are, or maybe you can't talk about it. <laughs> um, but if we were to come back here in a year from now, right, and we had a similar conversation, what would this group be surprised to hear that Yes Way was able to accomplish in 2020? We'll sell 10 million trucks, no. <laughs> um, so 2024 is the year of our 50th. So that will be the anniversary of the Allsup's burrito. Um, what I, makes this burrito so special? You've mentioned it twice now, I have to. Yes, I mean, you have to have it. So hopefully half the people in this room will seek it out and on your business travels, find a way to get it. But it is, it, it is a magic of a brand understanding its customer base and the communities that we serve. So I think you know every brand will say that, very few do that. You have no further to look than Bud Light, right? You want to alienate your core. Also, isn't that, right? It understands the red dirt communities that we serve or the urban communities in Albuquerque or Santa Fe or Abilene or Lubbock. And I think one year from now, the growth will be compelling. I always jokingly say, you know, we went from glorified startup to a top 15 retailer in the nation in under four years. In 2021, we were the convenience retailer of the year. Not saying that to brag, just saying that because you can accomplish a lot in a very short time with the focus team all working in Tampa. And we're very fortunate to have a world-class marketing, merchandising, loyalty brand team, and we all have passion for the brand. Um, you know, one thing that I've talked about, Joe, that I, I laugh about, and you're right, you have to try the burrito. But, you know, we always talk about brand love. And, you know, everywhere I've been, I've tried to get more brand love than what's warranted. So when I was at p and I had Pringles. It's like, well, I want people to have a tattoo. Like, no one loves Pringles to get a tattoo like no one There's that's a lot not of people out there maybe one right but that's not happening you know you see harley davidson you see even red bull like lifestyle brands 
Well, when we acquired Awesome's, and you know, Darren and I, they had no social media presence whatsoever. So we went on social media just to kind of look, and it's like, oh my God, like, it's a whole thing. People have started pages, they're talking about the burritos, people have bad tattoos. <laughs> Um, their slang from the region that we operate, and you know, I have to talk my general counsel now, all sick, which I had never heard that term before. You know, I knew enough that, okay, kids say sick to mean good, but all sick means it's like exceptional, extraordinary, and it plays off of awesomes. And they design it just like our logo. There were bands and lifestyle merchandise, and of course, we're here in Massachusetts with our legal counsel ready to shut all that down. Cease and desist, I'm gonna sue you, we own this brand, what the heck are you doing? And the deeper we got into it, we said, wait a minute, we need to nurture this. These are ambassadors and influencers, and so a year from now, I would hope that we can in influence that even further. You know, we've taken a brand that we went from, don't screw it up, right, to now saying, how high can I take this? And one of our call to actions is world famous. So when we talk about our food, you'll hear world famous burrito. And I hope a year from now that it is actually recognized and much more commonplace. In the markets that we operate, it already is. We'd love for it to be national. Or global. Think bigger. That's a great story, Derek. Great for great events. I think we got like one or two more minutes, so I always like to give the room a chance to kind of say hello to you and ask anything they want. You guys don't know anything about the brand. You should have lots of questions in this now. All the way in the back. Did you support the truck effort or the cup effort with any media? Like, would you, and how would you decide if you were going to do that next time? Yeah, so we did um, our own retail media network in the stores, obviously. We did social media heavy, and I believe Mike and team, from a loyalty standpoint, we captured so much customer data that we were able to target some of our best fountain customers. But by the time you spent the time, it's like now you're spending and we have no product you know, to offer them. So short answer, yes. Longer answer is I should have had more product to make the media work better. 10 million cups next year. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think merch is a big unknown, right? It's like how much you put, put behind it. Yes. And, until you know the demand for it. So there's one other up here. Go for it. It's a mix, and great question, honestly, because Darren and I and Mike, it keeps us up at night. When we purchased Allsops, it was David buying Goliath. And so the thought was, well, you're not gonna rebrand me, so it's Yesway, are you, right? Or some of the folks were, yeah, we're going to rebrand it to Yesway. Yesway is our vehicle for acquisition. I think immersing ourselves in the Allsops brand, we realized, well, wait a minute, we need these to work together, and so, from private label to a loyalty platforms to bringing the Allsup's food program into Yesway stores to making Yesway more visible within Allsup's, we wanted to have a two banner st strategy and be more transparent. It's easy to talk about brand management, like um, you know Brian was just from GM. You know a car guy will know that you know Cadillac and Chevy come from the same company. The average person may not, so we wanted it to be more known to the average person. That yes, don't be shy, yes way board also. Yes way's not gonna screw it up. <laughs> if anything, we're gonna learn from each other. And we took the best things that yes way brought to the table. Um, I often give Mike tremendous credit and I give Darren great credit. We had a loyalty program, we had a strategy, we had a brand before we had stores. Not a lot of retailers can say that. Um, most PE companies come in, they'll buy something, saddle it up with debt, and very short-term focus. You know, get your job done in two years and we're gonna flip it. That's not the way we want it. We were conscientious. We probably over-researched it, over-analyzed it, and were methodical and thoughtful, but then when it came out, the tone, how it connected was on point. Um, we worked with a brand insights firm to make sure that we were not, quote unquote, screwing it up, doing some ethnographic research and talking to consumers, both in the markets that were Yesway, which were relatively newer consumers, 
as well as the OSIPS markets. And you can't get an answer from insights and research, but you can get some validation and some courage to step into uncertainty and say, here's the path that we're taking. We just did an acquisition um, three months ago of a chain called Wranglers, and they have five stores. We branded three of them Yesway, two of them OSIPS. They're all within the same market. And some of the discipline is the brand tenants, right? What's the brand promise? What's the positioning? And if we feel it, you know, better satisfies also, so we'll go that path. Yes way, by definition, is less consistent. You know, we have yes ways that are 1,000 square feet. We have yes ways that are 100,000 square feet grocery stores and truck stops and everything in between, whereas also is consistent. I can take you in our oldest store and our newest layout where merchandise is oriented, how we message, and the consistency is all there. So it makes us more disciplined as uh, brand brand managers and brand stewards. Last one. You talked about the scorecard and being able to make changes and make an immediate impact. Can you also talk about um, making maybe bigger bets that might have less I love that. I love that question. Too. Yeah, I mean, do you, I always do you have a pie chart with data to show that. I, think, I mean, honestly, I've I, I've built my career on being a data driven marketer, right? I'm, that's that's my go to. B school, P and G. I always say I got my PhD when I went to P and G because data, 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 data. But to the heart of your question, I think instincts and balancing those two. That's the great differentiation. That's what goes from good to great. So. Take another Collins, you know, blue ocean strategy. Ooh, but you're just knocking them down right now. <laughs> I mean, but you have to be able to have the intuition. And I often think that a lot of that comes from the merchandising side more than marketing, because it's kind of saying what's cool, right? What's trendy? What's going to sell? What am I seeing? Um, you know, I think it was Henry Ford who said the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. So you can cheat code, right? You know, my team travels globally. Darren will go to Japan, um, and he'll see something in a convenience store there. He'll take pictures of it, and his intuition is saying, something about this feels right. I know we're in West Texas, and you would think there's no correlation whatsoever, but the data coupled with that gut says, you know what, maybe having a meal with smaller portions. I know everything in Texas is bigger, but households are getting smaller. People are looking for a healthy option just for themselves or as, you know, households get older, they want smaller portions and we'll act on that kind of stuff. So great question. I would honestly think that instinct and intuition has a lot more to do with what I call the breakthrough wins. I think to make sure you win more than you lose, it's always data driven. But the gut, you know, the gut can get you in a great shape, it can also leave you with a warehouse full of trucks. <laughs> that is a perfect a warehouse full of trucks. Guys, thank you very much. Derek, thank you for something.